Zimmerman. I say that slow because it's a long name and it's hard to say. What we're going to be doing today is making some mead. The most important step of any brewing day is to start out with a drink. I'll be having some honey mead. Honey, well, mead. They don't really need to call it honey mead wine because mead is a honey is a wine made from honey. From Stonebrook Winery in Kentucky. Good stuff. Very good. Mm. Skull. What we're going to be making today is essentially a semi-sweet mead. Which means we're going to have in the end about 12 pounds, 12.5 maybe, of honey and however much extra water it takes to to fill that to five gallons. The, every mead needs a name. Sometimes they take a bit to name themselves. This one in particular we'll be calling Odin's Tears of Golden Honey Joy. And I have to thank Josh Parker and Dave Brown for coming up with that name and the basic ingredients for this recipe. Say hi, Dave. Hello. Okay. And what we're going to have in it is couple of vanilla beans. I put just one in it before and you can sort of taste the vanilla. So I'm going to do two this time. Some cinnamon sticks. This is cinnamon bark really. Uh, I do raisins. They have some good wild yeasts on them, organic raisins. They also provide some nutrient and tannins. And what we're doing here is making mead like the Vikings would have done it. Which means they didn't have homebrew stores or any of, the, any of that kind of thing. And they wouldn't have used sorbite yeast or chemicals or anything like that. Generally, I do a wild fermentation or I save yeasts from prior batches to make my mead. But there's nothing wrong with using some store-bought yeast once in a while. And a good good yeast for, for a semi-sweet mead is the Lauvin D47. You can also use some champagne yeast if you want a drier mead. And you're going to use a little bit less honey for that as well. But we're doing a semi-sweet. I've, re I've hydrated the yeast in some water. If you can buy liquid yeast, if you have a homebrew store that provides that, go with that. Or just save your own yeast. You can go look at my blogs on earthandair.com on how to cultivate wild yeast. And I'll talk about that a little bit here. But it's pretty easy. There's a bit of an art to it. But I'll also be writing about it in my book, tentatively titled Make Mead Like a Viking. I will some stage in this video we should be providing a, a web page to sign up for that if you want to be notified. But back to the mead making. So we've got the vanilla beans, cinnamon sticks, the raisins, and I don't have it with me right now but in the secondary fermentation after it's initially fermented and I've moved it into the carboy, I will be adding some dried chili peppers that I grew in my garden. And I've done that before. It's a nice flavor to have in mead. It's doesn't make it super spicy. You just take a little bit after the sweetness of the mead, of the honey. You can taste taste the peppers on the end. So you don't have to put it in this one, but I, I, I like to put mead in or to put peppers in in mead every once in a while. So obviously water, good spring water. Um, you can use any water you would use for drinking, but try to make sure it's you know have a drink of it. If it tastes like good water, then go with it. The Vikings likely had access to some kind of spring when they could and used that water. A lot of medieval recipes probably use some nasty water. It's, it's hard to say. Some of the things you read about it, they recommend things like not using water from the gutter, which admittedly I, I would also agree with that. So who knows what they did, but we, we at least know, you know, we, we at least have access to good clean water and that's what you should use. And final ingredient, which I don't always use, I use them for lighter meads. You can buy pectic acid and acid blends and whatnot at homebrew stores. Citrus has acid in it. Lemons, oranges, tangerines, grapefruit. Um, again, I don't use it on lighter meads. It's good to have to kind of give it a little more body. Some recipes say to add it when you're initially making it. I like to wait until after it's fermented a bit and, and have a taste and if it feels like it could use a little something extra. Put maybe 
maybe one one lemon per five gallon batch. I'd start out with half and let it sit for a bit and taste it again. So again, lemon isn't absolutely necessary. You can also also use a bit of orange juice, maybe half a cup of orange juice to a five gallon batch. So next we will be going into how to actually make the mead. And once again, skull. I'm probably cut now. I think you just cut after my skull. I mentioned that the first step in making mead is to have a drink. And the second step in making mead is also to have a drink. And many other steps involve having a drink. Get every, plan everything in advance is a good idea and that way you can have just relax and have a good time while you're making it. I usually have some good folk metal or folk music going on in the background. On my own and have some fun or have some folks over helping, but my helper is hiding behind the camera right now. But drink, drink a little bit while you're done. Have a good time. Just don't drink too much until you're completely done. But a basic meat is incredibly easy to make. You really don't need to do a whole lot to initially make it. Um, you'll notice I'm not heating anything here, not not quite. A lot of medieval recipes and a lot of modern recipes call for boiling the honey and water and skimming off all of what they call the scum. I do the no heat method. I've uh, read about a few other folks that do it and people are beginning to realize that you're losing a lot of the aroma from the honey. You can pasteurize it, bring it up to I think 150 degrees or so, just not quite to boiling. Still that's not, you know, not really necessary. Because what I like to use is good local raw honey. You buy the standard cheap honey from the grocery store, you're getting some weird blend from China that probably has all kinds of odd stuff in it. That's for flavor, that's for health, that's for lots of reasons. So I need, will ferment at room temperature, so that's all you really need is for it to be at room temperature. And I often, like, as I mentioned, I often do wild ferments and you boil it, you're killing off any yeast that might be in the honey. Um, even if you're not doing wild ferments, I, I feel strongly that the no heat method makes the ideal mead. Although, admittedly, there are some meads in which I will heat. Braggot is one. Braggot is actually more of a beer than a mead, but it has a whole lot of honey in it. And it's incredibly tasty. Honey and hops and but you make it like you make beer, so that requires boiling the, uh, the wort. And for anybody that doesn't know, wort, W-O-R-T, is the beer before it is fermented. Wine and mead, as soon as we mix this honey and water, we have must. When it ferments, then we have mead. To start with, I've got half a gallon, about five and a half pounds of honey. And what I have the honey in, is some fairly hot water to help loosen up the uh, the honey in here. It can be a bit of a challenge to get all of it out. So I like to kind of warm it up beforehand at least. And sometimes I'll actually warm up the water that I'm mixing beforehand, not, like I said, not the boiling, but mostly it just helps the honey and water to mix. It helps the honey to get out of here. And once it's all out, there will still be a little bit I'll be putting some water in here and swishing it around. And in some cases, I just take, I leave a little bit of honey in there and I add some water and I make a small mead in a small jar. So that's about as much as we can get out of that for now. I'll be working the rest of that out later. I didn't mention the amount of water because in the end it's, you start out with so much honey for the recipe. In this case, about 12 pounds, a gallon's worth. You only need to add a little bit of water to actually get it to ferment. But I just, I usually add a couple gallons initially. Give it room if it happens to be an active fermentation. You want to get a little bit of room for any foam to kind of work its way through. And then, over time, you can add a little more water, a little more honey. By the time you put it in your carboy, in the secondary, fermentation you want to top that off so my point is when you're first doing this just you know, start out with a little bit of water a gallon or two enough to mix up the honey and dissipate it 
and as you can see, there are a couple of reasons I am stirring with my trusty stir stick, obviously to mix the honey. Well, there's not really a whole lot to see here, but when I get it all in here, as I mentioned, I have yeast for this, but if I do a wild fermentation, what I do is set this open crock with a cheese cloth over it, or a clean towel, and that's poor so it allows wild yeast to drop in. Wild yeast from raisin, or if you use apples or any other fruit that's organic, will have tons of yeast on it. But with wild yeast or without, you want to aerate a lot. If you happen to be making it in something like this, once you you just shake a lot, that, that will that will aerate it. In this case, for wild fermentation, I'll stir several times a day for a couple minutes. The Vikings and a lot of other ancient cultures, and even some modern ones, mostly outside of America, but that still brewed by traditional methods, usually had some sort of a kept some sort of a stirring stick around as they would pass their generations. Some would call it a totem stick or a magic stick because they didn't know what yeast was. We didn't even know that yeast was a separate substance until around the 1800s. And so that each time they used it, it would gather yeast and they would often carve like runes and, sort, and such into it and the yeast would actually collect into those runes. They didn't know that. They figured it was some sort of magic, which is why brewing and alcohol is actually an integral part of a lot of sacred uh, religious rites and that sort of thing. And you can read brewing books that will go into detail about all the chemical processes that are happening. And happening. And it's fun to know the chemistry, but I just like to think of it as brew pixies or fermentation gnomes or just a bunch of yeast are getting in there and we're and what we want to do is wake them up get them partying once they're awake they start eating all that co2 pooping it out but eventually they just completely obliterate themselves well they're really they just drink until they fall asleep and they drop to the bottom and that's where you gather a whole bunch of what's called it's called lees l-e-e-s the sediment that will be at the bottom of whatever you're fermenting once everything's through the point with all that is i like to have fun while i'm brewing i like to think about all kinds of gnomes and pixies and dragons and vikings because i just happen to like that kind of thing mead is one well it, it really is the most ancient alcoholic beverage you somebody accidentally mixed up a little bit of honey and water millennia ago likely it fermented they tasted it they liked it they had some more they were pleased and then over time they refined methods for how to actually do it so like i said i will be adding more water later i will be adding some to this to kind of get it likely what i'll actually end up using this, this for is a small meat we have our flavoring ingredients. Okay, break it up. Yeah, break it up. Apparently vanilla beans don't really need to be broken up. But I'll still work it around a bit to kind of help get the uh, flavoring juices from them going. If you use any kind of dry anything, it kind of helps to Sometimes you'll want to grind if you've got like cloves or something like that. You can grind them up. Raisins, uh, just a small handful. I don't know, 15, 20, something like that. Toss this yeast. Yeah. That's your yeast. Yeah. Did I already mention how I rehydrated this? <clears throat> rehydrated this? I believe I did. Dry yeast, put in some room temperature water, about 70 degrees or so, and let it sit out. I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour, and it'll start activating, and then you add it to the the must, and ooh, we'll start having fun. Still got a little bit of yeast in there, so we're going to try and get it all out. Sometimes, 
it helps to just talk a big loogie in it. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. I would never do such a thing. And at this point, we have pretty much made what will become meat. Some recipes can become infinitely more complex. There's obviously more we're going to need to do after this gets fermenting. But, it's also stick. It's good stick. So, what I'm going to do with this next is find somewhere fairly warm to keep it, about 70 degrees. It's getting a tad chilly around here in the Kentucky fall. So, I'll probably find a heating vent to set in there. Wrap a towel or blanket lovingly around it. Lovingly. Maybe fall asleep and wrap myself lovingly around it and stroke it and say nice words to it. It likes it when you do that. It does. I talk to my meat often. Mm -hmm. You, you want to get those, to wake those pixies up. Oh, definitely. Sometimes I've done that and the meat never does anything. I think it's scared of me. Well, you got to give it time. Okay. Well, anyway, we keep it warm. I mean, you can keep it, you can do it up to 90, 100 degrees if you want, but I don't recommend it. That can have negative effects. But 60 should work, especially if you've added yeast. 70 or so is ideal. 70, 80. And you just, you know, talk living to your meat. Some cultures would, they would, they would actually do that. They would stay up all night. Watching the meat, talking to it, telling it stories. To the gods. Um, Scandinavian cultures, in particular, wanted to invoke the Brigiman, essentially the brew man. And once it started fermenting, they invoked the Brigiman and they were happy. Sometimes, depending on the culture, it would either be, like I said, just, just being really soft and quiet and meditative around it. Others felt like they needed to be wild and crazy to wake them up and they'd have loud raucous Woo! parties and and just do everything they could playing pots and pans together to try to, try to wake up the <coughs> booze gods so it's like doing an open fermentation covering it up with something is absolutely necessary for a wild fermentation but even for a not so wild one I'll still do that. I'll set it somewhere warm. Come in, lift this up, stir it a couple times a day. This is, you know, to let any wild yeast that you want to drop into it, but it also keeps nasties out. Uh, flies, that sort of thing. You don't always keep ants out. Um, you want to keep some sort of an ant trap around. I do uh, honey water and a borax mix and it kills them. I did go away for a weekend once. Came back and my cloth had fallen into the mead, oh my. as did a whole lot of ants. That was actually the last vanilla mead that I made. Ants just provided nutrients. I skimmed them out, made the mead. It was a tasty mead. <laughs> so don't let that kind of thing concern you. Now I'll just go ahead and touch on what you'll be doing next once it's, give it a few days. In this case, it'll probably start fermenting, likely in a couple hours. Wild ferments can take a couple days, but when you've added yeast, it happens pretty quick. You are going to want to put it in a narrow necked carboy. With a stopper and a, an airlock, about half full of water, to allow gases to come out, bad air not to come in. And I will siphon it sometimes into that. Sometimes I'll just pour it with a funnel. So yeah, I, I can, I may demonstrate this in another video, but siphon it out, get it in there. If it doesn't quite reach the top, add more water or add a, a honey water mixture to get it all the way to the top. Pop this thing in here. What thing? This thing, the thing I was just talking about, the carboy, or the, the cork with the airlock. Weren't you listening? Jeez. Oh, it's time for the uh, third most important step. Have a drink. What? There's not going to be any left for you. You want any some? I don't think I've had too much. I don't think I can get it in there. Do you think we're boring anybody yet? 
hope so. That's my goal. Uh, uh. Yeah, just open your mouth, <laughs> you bird. Okay, so that 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 was pretty much it. We've essentially made me. Like I said, you fill, you'll want to fill that up to the close to the neck as possible, because even with the airlock on, any extra air in there can potentially potentially sour the meat a bit. Which the time or two that I've done that, other people have tasted that meat and thought it was good. I did, but. Yeah, that, there are ways to intentionally get that in. One of those is to leave this for okay. once after it's fermented, continue to leave it out, and that's when the acetobacteria, which is what causes the souring, will come in. And mm -hmm. it's if you have a little bit of sour in a mead, that is, I mean, sour beers are coming back. Mm -hmm. you make it. So if you just if it happens and you don't like it, don't toss it. Save it for someone else. Or use it to cook with. It makes great use of the cooking wine. I almost forgot about my drink. How could you forget? And I think I'm about done rambling for this stage of things. So. It's all. That beer's a bit brilliant. That beer's a bit brilliant. That beer's a bit brilliant. It won't smell the love. Oh, pins in the state. Oh, please, in your name. Oh, now the smooth liquor. Oh, won't smell the love. Das is vanilla bean. I am Zimmerman. I speak German. Not very well. Or das is vanilla bean. Das cinnamon stick. Das cinnamon stick. Yeah. Yeah. No. Ow. You deserve that. <laughs> <laughs>